Good evening, delegates, to this 100th annual convention of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. My name is Rosalind McAllister Brock, and I am Vice Chairwoman of the National Board of Directors of the NAACP. It is my great pleasure to act as your presiding officer this evening. Let's take this opportunity to thank the Centennial Choir under the direction of Dr. Gregory Hopkins. This is his second time being the convention choir director when we've hosted a convention here in New York. Let's give it up for that 125 voice choir. We've not had a choir like that. They can't hear you, they've left the building and we need to let them know that we appreciate how they have set the tone for us this evening. Friends, I'm joined tonight by a fellow colleague on the member of the National Board of Directors, Mr. Jerome W. Montesire from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who will serve as the parliamentarian for this session. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you, Mrs. Brock, and on behalf of all of you who have joined this 100th anniversary centennial celebration, I'm proud to be with you and under the watchful eyes of our God, a most powerful God in the universe. Additionally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank once again our convention musician, Reverend Dr. Ronald Terry, Listen as he demonstrates his excellent musical talent on the fantastic Hammond B3 organ. Reverend Terry. For the sixth time in its 100-year history, the NAACP is convening its national convention in the Empire State of New York. As we embark upon this centennial celebration, I'm truly honored to be in New York again, serving as your convention chair a privilege I have enjoyed for the past decade. As I view the audience from this podium, I see the hands of thousands of stalwart men and women from across the length and breadth of this nation who have held and continue to hold the NAACP together. I also see hundreds of young people who will continue the fight for social justice established by their forebears in 1909. <laughs> Friends, I'm not only honored, but I'm humbled to be in the presence of the Almighty God who has brought the NAACP through many dangers, toils, and snares but we boldly proclaim that we're still standing and we are 100. In this audience tonight, I see heirs of a group of people who had the audacity to dream bold dreams that our country would stand up against lynching of colored people. In this audience, I see dreamers and fighters victors and survivors who can attest to the fact that no matter how difficult the moment, no matter how frustrating the hour, no matter how dark the day or difficult the night, the NAACP has been a beacon light atop the watchtower of humanity illuminating a course for American society to dream bold dreams and achieve big victories for civil and human rights in this nation. 
from Plessy versus Ferguson to Brown versus the Board of Education, from Murray versus Maryland to Smith versus Allwright from 1909 to 2009. All of these victories and many, many more has taken us from the outhouse all the way to the White House. Sadly, sadly, my friends, despite bold dreams and big victories, there are those among us who believe that we have dreamed boldly enough. There are those who believe that we have finished our fight, that every battle has been fought and every victory has been won. There are many who believe that the NAACP is no longer needed and should remain silent on social justice issues of the day because we live in a post-racial society. To the naysayers, I stand here tonight to share the words of Abraham Lincoln, who said to sin by silence when they should protest makes cowards of men. Dr. King simply said, silence is still betrayal. And so my brothers and sisters, after 100 years of struggle and progress, it's wrong for us to be silent now. We are the NAACP, and we will not be silent until we find a way to provide quality health care for some 47 million people in this country who are uninsured. We will not be silent while 13 million children languish in poverty, subjected to substandard housing and public education systems. We will not be silent until all children can swim at the Valley Swim Club in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. We will not be silent until employment rates for African Americans are higher and higher. We will not be silent until the rate and the spread of HIV and AIDS in our community are significantly lower. And we will not be silent until there is justice for Sean Bell. Reggie Clemens, and yes, even Troy Davis. NAACP, do you know who you are? Ladies and gentlemen, we're fired up and we're ready to go. And it is that fire that's still burning deep within our hearts that allows us and challenges us to continue to dream boldly, that gives us the strength to climb every mountain, walk through every valley, and be victorious in battle, because we are the NAACP. We won't back down. We won't back up. We won't be silent. And we're certainly not going to let anybody turn us around. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, by the power invested in me, by the chairman of the board of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, I do hereby duly declare the Centennial Convention of the NAACP duly opened. <laughs> As we take our seats, I'm sorry, I, I asked you to sit down, but I need you to stand up for the singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing. 
that will be led by Janae Bridges of the Harlem Opera Theater from New York, New York. Friends, please remain standing for the invocation, which will be provided by Reverend Dr. Agnes Blackman of Westminster Bethany Presbyterian Church of Brooklyn, New York. And then remain standing for the posting of the colors by the United States Marine Corps, followed by the national anthem. One more thing that we ask, delegates, please turn off your phones and your pages so that we may be courteous to our fellow delegates, Reverend Blackman. 